So um, a few years ago, uh, I wrote uh, with a I and my team wrote this series of books, Modernist Cuisine, Modernist Cuisine at Home, and uh, a photography book. Um, at the time we did it, you know, the, 20, the market for 2,400-page cookbooks was kind of zero. Um, uh, amazingly, people actually liked it. We've sold uh, 270,000 copies uh, around the world. So we were casting around to say, well, what, um, what do we do next? Uh, and we decided we would work on bread. So uh, this is the, the core team. Uh, now, besides uh, these folks in the kitchen, we also have um, uh, a set of photography team, an editorial team. It's a huge effort making these books, and uh, we certainly couldn't uh, do it without all the folks in it. Uh, here's our lab in Seattle uh, where we create our books. Um, we have uh, a machine shop right next door to this. Uh, and a biology lab across the hall. So we're kind of equipped to do almost anything we want to do. Um, so here's the Modernist Bread Book. Five volumes, 2,642 pages, 53.3 pounds. Um, my favorite statistic is coming up. Um, four pounds of ink. <laughs> now, that sounds absurd. And when... when the, when I was first you know, getting ready for modernist cuisine, I, they make these blank books to show you what it'll look like. And I said, well, what's the difference between this and the, um, uh, and the real thing? And the printer says, well, it'll, it'll be much thicker because of the ink. And I laughed. Ha, ha, ha. And they said, no, really, on a full page photo, there's about a thousandth of an inch of ink. Now, you have a thousand photos like that. That's an inch worth. <laughs> and so literally, there are four pounds of ink in our book. Um, now, it, my family's relationship with grain goes way back. Uh, this is my grandfather uh, farming uh, grain in Minnesota around 1920. Uh, and uh, it, it, after I learned about, more about grain agriculture and the economics of it, I talked to my 90-year-old mother, and I said, Mom? Thanks for leaving the farm. <laughs> it's a really hard thing. Uh, but without what, without what they do, we really couldn't do any of this. Um, and and I, I have to thank Peter. Peter was involved in, in the bread book. Um, early on, when I was looking at doing a book on bread, I was talking to somebody, and they kept saying, BBA. And like I knew DDT was desired dough temperature, but what the hell was BBA? And I, I, I finally asked, and I said, well, come on, Bread Baker's Apprentice, which is uh, the, uh, uh, one of Peter's great books, and it's so well known that everyone's supposed to know it just by the initials. Um, so that, well, anyone who's got a book like that, I really ought to talk to, and Peter was really invaluable in helping us uh, uh, with the book. Um, we have a lot of volumes. Uh, the first volume is History and Fundamentals. Uh, the second one is ingredients. Third is techniques and equipment. Then we have two volumes of recipes and then a kitchen manual because our book is kind of big and kind of pretty to bring into the kitchen. So uh, the recipe manual um, serves that purpose. Now, believe it or not, we actually had to cut over 400 pages to make it this size. Um, people say, well, why on earth did you write a 2,600-page book on bread? And I say, well, you got to rely on somewhere. Um, <laughs> I often get asked, what, what are our books? Who, what are these for? You know, who are you writing for? Is this a professional book? Is this an amateur book? And I always like to say it's for people who are passionate and curious about food. Uh, if you're not passionate, you don't need a 2,600-page book. And if you're not curious, there's plenty of books that will say, have recipes. And the idea behind a recipe is they say, do this, do this, do this, and you get a result. And if it's a decent book and you follow that recipe, you'll get that result. If you're curious as to why you do those steps, that's not what recipe books are typically about. And that's, that is why what we write our books for. And really, it doesn't matter if you're a home cook 
or you're a restaurant chef making bread, um, those are professionals, but they're not professional bakers. And as you may have experienced, there's plenty of great restaurants that don't make good bread. Um, so we figured that was a good audience to talk to. They're professionals, but not in this field. They have ovens, but maybe not the right kind of oven. So how, what do you do for them? And finally, for professional bakers, at least small scale professional bakers. Um, uh, I don't know how to bake bread in a factory, and I don't have much to say about that. But for an artisanal scale baker, uh, I, I, we thought that would also be relevant. And then just people who are in the industry who are interested in bread. The main difference between these people is their oven. You can make bread with just a flat surface, the ingredients in your hands. Okay, you don't actually even need a bowl, but you need an oven. And the, the ovens are so different that we had to test everything in all those different kinds of ovens, and uh, that made a, a difference. Well, we discovered a couple things about bread. Um, and we kind of better have discovered a few things for if it's a 2,600-page uh, <laughs> book. And I, I can't go over all of them today, so I'm going to go over a few. I know that um, Francisco Bingoya, my co-author, uh, spoke at the symposium last year and covered some. I'm going to cover a different set. So the, uh, the first topic is about dough handling. And it really comes up with hala. Hala is uh, a braided... Um, uh, Jewish uh, egg uh, bread. Uh, there's lots of other braided breads, but challah is one that most people who make challah say, if you don't braid it, it isn't really challah. Um, and the problem with doing the braiding is twofold. Well, one is you have to keep track of, of the different cylinders of dough, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is how do you get even cylinders of dough? Because the dough is elastic. You roll it out, and then it kind of stretches back. You roll it out, and then you finally lean on it, and now you've got a thin spot. Um, the same thing happens as you braid. If you're, not, if you're not extremely careful, as you braid, you pull a little more on one than the other, and you thin it out, and then you get a very uneven one. So what could, I, I was trying to think, what could we do about this to make it easier? Um, now, Enzymes have a, uh, a function much like those scissors. Uh, if you have a, a long chain molecules, enzymes will come and snip specific parts off. Um, for some aspects of bread uh, b uh, baking, there's um, a set of enzymes called amylases. An amylase attacks amylose, which is a starch that's present. But that elasticity that makes the hala difficult to roll out, that elasticity is due to the proteins in the, in the bread. So you need a protease. So what can you do about it? Well, it turns out a little bit of kiwi juice or pineapple juice. Um, and it, it, one of the things I love about this is when I say, oh, we found this way to make hala braiding much easier. And people say, oh, well, what's the trick? And you say, pineapple juice they totally think you're joking. But uh, kiwis, pineapples, papayas, and figs all have uh, an enzyme in it that's a protease. And the enzyme will um, attack uh, protein molecules and snip them. Uh, that's why each of those can be used as a, um, uh, as a meat tenderizer. Uh, so it turns out just a couple drops is all you need. In fact, what our, the e easy recommendation is you buy one of those uh, little uh, canisters of fruit salad like from uh, uh, Whole Foods, and you take one little piece of uh, uh, pineapple and squeeze it, and uh, it makes your dough very elastic. So this is some challah dough that we uh, made that way. Uh, we've rolled it out as thin as the lead in a lead pencil, and it works fine. Uh, yet, it also doesn't compromise uh, it uh, rising and doing other things, and it also uh, doesn't spring back when you do it. So that is sort of our first uh, question. 
Um, here's a second one. Um, this is, I could just uh, watch this all day long. Um, <clears throat> this is a time lapse of a baguette in an oven. Well, uh, one of my first baking experiences, I was probably 10 years old. Um, when I was nine, I decided I would cook Thanksgiving dinner all by myself. And I went to the library, and I got all these books, and I went to the store, and I made Thanksgiving dinner. And it was not a total disaster. If it was a total disaster, I would not be standing here today. Um, well, the next year, I decided I would be a little more um, adventuresome. So I got Julia Child's Art of French Cooking. And I tried to make the baguette recipe. Well, I'll start with something simple. Um, <laughs> my grandmother had helped me make sort of farm-style bread earlier, um, and I was fascinated, because here you take this white powder and water, and you make this thing that's just like it came from the store, only it smells great. So I thought it was fantastic. Well, Julia Child's recipe had this key step that you put a spritzer bottle against uh, a hot cookie sheet to make steam. Because the book said steam would make your baguette crispy. I'm thinking, water can't make it crispy. Water should make it soggy. What is up with that? Well, it came to do our bread book. I thought, well, this is great. I will now look up what people have figured out, because someone must have figured out why. this. And it turns out no one had figured out why. Um, in particular, there were a couple of theories that were out there, but the, the theories both contradicted each other, so they couldn't both be true. And then it was pretty obvious that they couldn't both be right. Um, so here was actually a, a key step. I had dim sum. And while having dim sum, I was playing with my food in a way that you probably shouldn't. Um, and I discovered this. You can actually peel a dim sum, uh, a bow, like an orange. Uh, it, it, the skin on the outside is, is quite tough, and so you can pull it off. So that was a hint. Um, one of the things that was claimed in the previous people who looked into this is they said, well, uh, what happens is that if you steam it, water is on the outside of your dough, and that water plus heat will gelatinize the starch, and that will make it shinier. Well, that's really true, okay? And you can see this, both the bow is shiny and bagels are shiny. Now, another claim was that you get more oven spring if you have more steam. So we tried this, and this turns out to be false. Um, it, it makes sense because you say, well, if I put my, uh, if I have steam when I put my bread in the, the steam is hot, the bread is colder, even if it's uh, at proofing temperature, it's colder. So you get condensation, and that means the outside doesn't actually get hard early. And so I'll get more oven spring. Only in our test, that did, wasn't true. Um, and the, the key insight there is that's also why you slash the tops of breads. That's where the expansion happens. Um, and oven spring is due to uh, steam expanding bubbles that the yeast had already made. So the, the, the gas that causes um, your bread, your dough to rise initially, that gas is carbon dioxide, which is exhaled. It's the, the breaths out from the yeast, or sometimes you say it's the farts from the yeast. It's, <laughs> Ye yeast don't particularly have the anatomy where there would be a difference. Um, uh, but then its oven spring is due to steam, because the water, as the bread starts to bake, the water boils. And it takes a while for the, the bubbles that are on the interior to get hot enough. And that's why the initial uh, oven spring doesn't matter. Um, uh, then the other claim was that it was this gelatinization of the crust of the uh, outside that made it uh, crispy. But what about bagels? Most bagels these days are steamed. You can also boil them. Either way, you're gelatinizing the starch. And no one would describe a bagel as being crispy. You'd describe a bagel as being chewy. Uh, also, 
Uh, no one would describe a bagel as having that much oven spring. In fact, the whole point is by making that skin on the outside, you've constrained it so it's a very tight crumb. Um, so he here's the actual story, and it's related to the fact that bread bakes ridiculously quickly for something of its size. You know, if you baked a or roasted a like a big beef rib roast about this big, it would take you hours. You uh, you bake a boule, a loaf of, round loaf of bread this big, it takes you twenty minutes. How come? Well, this is why. Um, the crust blocks any steam. Once, once you've formed the, uh, the crust and you've got that skin like we saw in the bow, that skin stops steam from leaving. Yet, as the bread gets hot, you're generating steam. So what's that steam going to do? Well, it actually penetrates to the interior of the bread. Uh, and uh, once it gets down to the interior, it will condense again. So it's actually, you're taking moisture from the outside and driving it in. But when uh, steam condenses back to water, it gives off a tremendous amount of heat. And this is what you find in an apartment house, uh, but like a New York apartment house where there's a boiler room. The boiler room makes steam. That's very similar to what happens at, at the edges of the bread. And then, the radiators are what heat the apartments. You don't heat the apartment by building a big fire in the first floor and then hoping the heat soaks through the floors. That would take forever and it would make it impossible to live in the first, second floor. Uh, instead, you send steam pipes, and the steam pipes carry the, this very quickly. So that also plays a big role with the bread being crispy. The more impenetrable that outer layer is, the thinner the crust becomes. Um, so we did a whole bunch of measurements. And a baguette is a particularly interesting thing to do a measurement on. If you look at the, what the French call the grigne, the, the ears here, where you've done the slash, the crust is way thicker than it is uh, over in these other areas. And that top part, I would describe as crunchy, not crispy. The crispiness is really about having a thin crust. Um, so dry plus thin is crispy. Now with a bagel, it's way thicker. That's why it's chewy. So to test this, we said let's take some bagel dough and bake it like it was a baguette, and take some baguette dough and bake it like it was a bagel. And in fact, when you do that, you find that uh, the, uh, if you bake it like a baguette, it doesn't matter what the dough is, it's going to be crispy. And if you bake it like a bagel, meaning you do the long steam up front, it's going to be chewy, even if it's a, a, a baguette dough. So gluten-free bread is another topic. This is a little bit of a vexing topic for most bakers, because um, bread, to first order approximation, is the art of making wonderful food based on gluten. So the whole gluten-free movement is something of an attack on bread, or many people view it that way. Um, this was one of the uh, little things we put in the book. Uh, Google has a service where they, will, they track the, the queries, and you can see what the trend over time in a query is. So if you look here, celiac disease, which is a serious condition uh, about 0.75%, a little less than 1% of people have it. And you can see the celiac queries to Google are essentially flat over this period of time. The gluten-free queries explode. And that's because gluten-free is really not connected to the, uh, the medical condition of uh, celiac. It's connected to people doing a self-diagnosis. Now, in, in medicine, we have learned through very bitter experience that when you have a new medicine or a new uh, medical device, you do what's called a double-blind study. That means you don't tell some of the patients are on the new drug and some are on a placebo, a, a, a sugar pill. 
that does nothing. But they don't know. The other thing is you, get, you can't even tell the doctor. That's what double blind means. The doctor doesn't know which of his patients are getting the sugar pill and which one are, is getting the real medicine. You say, well, why can't we tell the doctor? Well, bitter experience has taught us that expectations matter. And if you have a, pre, a, a predetermined expectation, it subtly affects the results. And oops, you approved a medicine that doesn't work, for example. Or you, you disposed of one that does work. And self-diagnosing yourself as, as not being able to tolerate gluten uh, is that kind of a thing. Um, scientists have tried to find people who are sensitive to gluten who don't have celiac disease. And the way this works is they get a bunch of people who swear they're sensitive to gluten. They randomly divide them into two groups. One group uh, gets a gluten-free diet for a week. The other group gets a gluten-free diet that has been spiked with pure gluten. <laughs> can they tell? And the answer is, so far, no one can tell. So that Now, at the same time, I don't believe I should tell anyone what they should eat. That's not my job. There are personal preferences. If someone wants gluten-free, I think that's their right. Uh, the, the only reason we put the, the, sort of the scientific facts in the book is people take it beyond a personal preference, where they try to shame other people, like, I can't believe you're doing that to your body. Or, oh my god, you're doing that to your own children. And, <laughs> That kind of shaming, I think, is not appropriate unless there's really strong scientific evidence. Now, uh, anyway, so we decided we will make a gluten-free bread chapter. Now, it's, in order to make a gluten-free bread, first you should understand how gluten actually works. Um, this is a proofing basket that we cut in half along with the uh, dough that was in it. And of course, proofing is about trapping uh, gas from the yeast in these things. And this works because gluten um, traps the gas very well, and it's very elastic. So it both expands, and it's also gas impermeable. You can think of each of these bubbles like a little balloon. Well, the kids' balloons are made of rubber. It's stretchy, and it traps the air. That's exactly what gluten does. Um, now, gluten also adds elasticity and chewiness uh, to the bread, both in the phase when uh, you're making it uh, as dough and then later in the bread. Uh, it, gluten isn't what holds the bread up. Um, effectively, it holds the dough up because the tension in the gluten in those little bubbles is what keeps it there, but once the bread is baked, it's gelatinized starch that actually makes the bread hold up. So if we want to make a gluten-free bread, we need a way to trap the gas. And so the typical way to do that is to make a gel of some sort. Um, uh, you need to have a thick enough liquid. And so there's a couple different things people use. Um, if you take chia seeds, um, basil seeds also work. And you soak them in water, they expand, and they get this mucus around them. It almost looks like a frog's egg. Um, we call that chia snot, because <laughs> um, boy, does it have that texture. But it works great for trapping the gas. Um, xanthan gum is a, uh, another thickener. Uh, xanthan is made by fermenting uh, some bacteria. The bacteria uh, have a cell wall that makes this kind of a, uh, a very um, thick, thick uh, substance and you mix it with water. Um, xanthan gum sounds strange, but really it's no stranger than vinegar, uh, which is also a product that's made from bacterial fermentation. OK, so that, that helps with the trapping the gas. But then you also need to make it chewy. And there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, you can do it with uh, something called glutinous rice flour which sure sounds like it has gluten in it, but it doesn't. Um, glutinous rice is the rice that is used in Japan to make a, um, a, a sweet called a mochi. And that's kind of stretchy. <laughs> it's kind of like the whole point of mochi is that it's elastic. Um, 
you can also use something called transglutamase. Now, that's an enzyme. I, I mentioned enzymes can snip molecules. They can also stick molecules together. So transglutamase uh, is also known to chefs as meat glue. It sticks protein molecules together, and it, it helps bind them. Um, it, again, it sounds weird, but it comes from bacterial fermentation. And it's an enzyme that actually is in every cell in your body. So it's not like it's a terrible thing, but it sure sounds weird. Um, uh, whey and other sources of protein can also give you uh, some stretch. Well, then somebody, uh, a science writer uh, I know who is a celiac, said, God, I would kill for a gluten-free bagel. And I said, well, good luck for, with that, because it's very hard to get. You can, you can make the, uh, uh, the elasticity in the crumb, but if you go too far with the elasticity, you get gluten-free bread that's like a kitchen sponge. Um, Usually it tastes about like that also. Um, I said, you're never going to get it. But then I went on a trip, and uh, I w was having some soft tacos. And I, I thought, you know, tortillas are tough. And they're, they're, they're sort of the whole, you couldn't make a soft taco or a burrito out of a corn tortilla if it didn't have some toughness. So uh, well, maybe we can use that. Now, uh, it turns out that the way you make uh, corn tortillas is you make something called masa harina. And that is, goes through a process that goes by the Aztec name nixtamal. So nixtamal is you take the corn and you boil it uh, with some lime. And I don't mean the kind of lime you put into a uh, margarita. Uh, I mean <laughs> calcium <laughs> hydroxide. Uh, by boiling with lime, it changes the corn in some fundamental ways. That's what hominy is. Hominy is corn that's had this done to it. Masa harina is corn that has been boiled with this lye, or these days they pressure cook it, uh, then dried, then ground into flour again. Now, this confused the hell out of me, because the, the, the normal story about starch gelatinization is that starch gelatinizes in the presence of water and heat, and you can do it once. But tortillas are made out of uh, corn that was already boiled to death. How come? And so I said, this, this makes no sense. And we looked at all these books. We couldn't find anything. In, in, uh, in any baking book. And, uh, and so I, just, I thought, you know, if this was true, then we ought to be able to unslice a loaf of bread. Um, well, it turns out you can re-gelatinize starch. Uh, and not only can you re-gelatinize it, but the, 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 gelatinous, the gelatin that you, or the gelatinized starch layer that you form, it's not gelatin, is way stronger the second time. Because uh, the other thing that confused the hell out of me is, OK, tortillas are tough, but cornbread is not tough. In fact, most cornbread recipes involve adding some wheat flour so the thing doesn't fall apart. So what's up with that? Um, so I was just getting very confused. And uh, well, this is, this is silly. This would mean you could unslice a loaf of bread. I'm here to tell you, you can unslice a loaf of bread. Um, uh, you you t take a loaf of bread, spray the slices with um, water. It, it helps if it's a nice machine sliced loaf, because then they really fit together nicely. <laughs> um, uh, reassemble the loaf, put it in aluminum foil, heat it in an oven for 30 minutes, and by God, it will re-gelatinize. The other, here's, the, once I saw this, I realized there was another thing that confused the hell out of me. Um, if you've been to Costco and had a Costco hot dog, what you will discover is the Costco, they, they take, and lots of hot dog places do this, they take the hot dog, they put it into a bun, they put the thing into this little steamer deal, and they usually they pump a little bit of steam, 
And then they wrap it up in a little foil, they hand it to you. By the time you get over to the counter to put the mustard on, you open it up and the bread is stuck to itself and it's stuck to the hot dog. I was like, well, what's up with that? Well, by God, that's what's up with it. Um, so, uh, did I? Oh, I've, I've, I've broken something here. Um, one second. Okay, so it turns out masa harina works fantastically well to make a gluten-free bagel. Um, uh, you, uh, you use a other sort of gluten-free flours, but by adding masa harina, uh, you can also add other pre-gelatinized starches, and if you add masa harina, you, there is a corn taste that comes out, and I really like it. Um, so not only can you make a gluten-free bagel, uh, I had to eat a lot of bread for this book. Um, <laughs> like, I gained 15 pounds. Um, uh, the, the trouble with tasting these gluten-free bagels is I always finish them, which is a bizarre thing uh, when it comes to uh, gluten-free. Um, but that's not generally our experience with other gluten-free breads. Okay, we all love ice cream. Never in history has there been an ice cream riot. And that's important because grain and bread have a very special role in our lives. There have been bread riots throughout history. Um, here's Boston in 1711, London in 1815, Yemen in 2011. Um, and if you count French farmers blockading the streets of Paris with their, um, uh, their tractors, there's bread riots there too. Bread has been such a fundamental food that if you change the price of it, you change the availability of it, it's a big deal. Now, this affects the way we think about bread in lots of ways. Um, and one of those ways is that our society went on a mission to make uh, grain cheap. So this is a, a, uh, a graph of the price of wheat in the United States adjusted for inflation. And since 1917, it has dropped by a factor of 10 in price. Um, in fact, wheat is cheaper than dirt. Okay? Uh, here is potting soil, 85 cents a pound. Wheat is seven cents a pound, flour 24 cents a pound. We achieved this insane amount of agricultural productivity. Um, now, unfortunately, this also means we treat farmers like dirt. So this is our, our clever, it's not a pie chart, it's a loaf chart, um, that shows the relative pieces of the economics that go into a loaf of bread. And the US Department of Agriculture uh, made this. The smallest amount of, of the price is the farmer gets. From a typical supermarket loaf of bread that costs about $2 to $2.50, the farmer gets five cents. Now, I particularly like this line here, finance and insurance, eight cents. Now, have you ever had a loaf of bread and said, wow, this is a really well-insured loaf? <laughs> hey, now, in many ways, it was great that we went on this mission to make bread cheap. Um, we, we solved starvation as a problem. Unfortunately, we also created obesity as a problem. Um, it, we don't need to have that. Oh, here's another statistic. 1830, uh, one farmer would feed about four people. That includes the farmer and his family. <laughs> By 1940, it was one to 10. Today, it's more like one to 200, um, which is why very few people in the United States are farmers anymore, but we still have plenty of food. In fact, when it comes to grain, the irony is that American farmers can produce grain more cheaply than people anywhere else in the world. Um, now, here's the problem, though. What it means is that there's a limited variation. Uh, you know, that you can get flour that's $7 for a 50-pound sack. You can pay $38 for a 50-pound sack for very special flour. 
But that's actually a relatively narrow range. Um, it, pr price in bread, similarly. You can get that $2 uh, loaf of bread. In a bakery, typical uh, bakery uh, bread is maybe $4.50 a loaf. Um, at Tartine, it's $9.75, and they line up around the block. Um, I have a son who lives uh, two blocks away in San Francisco, and uh, he gets it all the time. Uh, but that's a very rare circumstance. Now, in general, if we want much better food, in every other kind of food, we actually have to pay for it. And, and here's a good example of this funny attitude. Would you pay for bread in a restaurant? Lots of people say, no, bread should be free. Well, how good can it be if it's going to be free? And the people say, no, but bread really should be free. And then I, I say, OK, how about risotto? Should risotto be free? <laughs> and they'll say, well, no, risotto. Uh, no, that's like this thing the chef makes. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is an article from Grub Street about a $95 plate of risotto in, uh, in New York City. Uh, it's got truffles and other expensive stuff in it. But it doesn't matter exactly which risotto. Well, even though risotto is a bunch of starch, a bunch of rice, uh, well, you, if you buy the really special Arborio rice, if you, uh, d people say, yeah, I should be able to, $10, $20, that's, why wouldn't you pay that for bread? And it, I understand culturally why. We have this relationship that bread was this staff of life that was the major source of calories. Uh, it isn't anymore. Um, but look, let's look at coffee. Okay? When I was a kid, coffee meant Folgers, at, and Folgers today is $4 a pound. Um, Jamaica Blue Mountain at Starbucks, at the Starbucks Reserve Store, is $70 a pound. Um, there's uh, this stuff called Kopi Luwak that's a couple hundred dollars a pound, and, and it's made from the feces of a cute animal called the palm civet, but that's a digression. Um, <laughs> how about chocolate? When I was a kid, chocolate meant Hershey's, and that's about $5 a pound. But today, you can get single origin, Ecuadorian, only grown on the north side of the hill, very special, bean to, uh, uh, to bar, and we're willing to pay for it. And look, I think not everyone is going to uh, have $31 a pound chocolate. On the other hand, you don't have to have it all that often. And as a special treat, I think it's a better world if we have those choices. Today, we still don't have those choices for bread. Um, and so the road to quality in every other part of cooking is, first of all, you need to have a premium grain agriculture. There's no reason we have to only spend five cents on a loaf to, to the farmer on a loaf of bread. That doesn't mean uh, you can charge just for the sake of it. It has to actually be better. But I think there's a real opportunity to, to make it better. Um, in, in Washington State, near us, uh, Steve Jones, for example, is working very intensively on trying to develop uh, varieties of wheat where the taste is a major factor. Imagine that. Because the, the, the mission our society has been on is yield. Yield, man, more tons per acre or bushels per acre. That's what we're all about, bushels per acre, b bushels per acre. And if you optimize for that, that's what you'll get. Um, but you know, some people say, oh, well, that's the big corporate agriculture. That's the, um, the, this whole uh, terrible food system. It actually does come back to consumers. If you're not actually willing to pay more or to go a little bit out of your way, well, then you're going to keep getting what you're getting. You're, you're not going to get something better. Um, so, uh, you know, another part of this is, in fact, one of the big reasons we wrote Modernist Bread is that there's been this persistent feeling in the world of bread that the best bread was in the past. And artisanal baking was a way for us to recapture some bit of that past glory. Um, 
this is totally wrong, so far as I'm concerned. The, the best bread being baked in the world today is being baked now. The past had all kinds of problems we conveniently forget when we have this rosy view of it. Um, but I think that even better bread is yet to come. And I think that's really true if we can get the consumer to demand it, to expect it, and to also be willing to pay for it. Anyway, that's what I have. I don't know if there's time for questions. We have a little time for, for, for questions. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll turn this mic on. Okay, does anyone have any? We have a little bit of time for, for Q and A. Uh, any any questions for Nathan? Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you the microphone. Oh, <laughs> I, I I forgot the shameless plug. Our next book is Modernist Pizza. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, wouldn't it make sense that? The next book should be Modernist Pizza. I mean, what's bigger than pizza? <laughs> Can we get a discount coupon for the books? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that is a serious question. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, it actually, the book costs you a lot less than it cost me. <laughs> <laughs> should, should, a, should a book be free? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? I know a lot of the points that, that Nathan, uh, lay, he laid out a lot of interesting sort of topic points that we're going to be revisiting throughout the symposium, especially this issue of, of uh, value of wheat, quality of bread, uh, a lot of things like that. So uh, I think we've, we've got some good you know, starting points to continue uh, to build on over the next few days. Glenn, do you have a question? Yes. Let me say it in the mic because we're, this is all going out live stream to the world, so we want to make sure that everyone's hearing. Nathan, uh, will your team uh, be interested in the sensory aspects of looking at ancient flatbreads in this new book? Will you be looking at the fundamentals of cereal culture starting from way back, or are you attacking it on a modern basis? Well, in the bread book, we have a whole history that uh, goes all the way back to what's arguably the first bread. Um, for a long time, people thought the first bread was uh, probably 10 or 12,000 years old. Uh, it, but then a Canadian anthropologist found a cave in Mozambique that had pounding stones. The pounding stones have been used to make flour out of wild sorghum. And so what people thought, well, you couldn't make bread until you were you domesticated grain. This guy says, no, actually, you could make it out of wild grain. In fact, if you weren't eating wild grain, why did you bother to domesticate it? You didn't say, you know, we're going to grow this stuff and someday we'll eat it. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and um, in, um, in parts of, in Ethiopia has a bread called injera. And in parts of Ethiopia, they make it out of sorghum. So we think the first, the first bread was probably an injera-like flat bread baked on a rock. Uh, made out of sorghum sourdough. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the sensory characteristics. Um, I spent a week in Naples eating pizza and doing research for the book. Um, <laughs> actually, starting, uh, uh, starting uh, on uh, Saturday, I will be doing more research from Naples, uh, no, from uh, uh, Florence north to Milan to see their take on pizza. But, for the traditional, uh, what, the Vera Pizza Napolitana, their latest campaign is a bunch of uh, uh, posters that show someone biting into pizza with the caption, if you hear a crunch, it's not authentic. They believe that pizza has to be super soft. And uh, so we're going to have reproduce this in our book and say, but it might taste good. <laughs> it's very funny. In Rome, pizza is supposed to be crunchy. So it's an example of how people have very different metrics that they apply to is this good or not. Um, in fact, we have another section in the book that's called That's Not Pizza. Because wherever you go in the world, people have their kind of pizza. And then you ask them about this other thing, and they'll say, oh, that's not pizza. Um, next question. 
Yes. We have time for one more question. Yeah. You said, you said uh, one of the primary differences was the, their access to equipment or the oven. Yep. What, from a technique perspective, is the biggest takeaway for the home baker, uh, either from a process standpoint or from a tool acquisition standpoint from your research? Black cast iron pots. Um, so, it, in order to bake, it, to bake a pan bread, uh, a sandwich style bread, or an enriched bread like brioche, a home oven works fine. Uh, you need to calibrate your home oven to know if 450 is really 450, because it rarely is. Um, but other than that, there, that's fine. The problem with a home oven is that if you're making a bread that is meant to be baked outside of a pan, uh, and if you're making one that you want to do steam injection, you're kind of stuck. You know, a professional uh, bread baker's a deck oven, you control the, the temperature of the floor, you control the temperature of the ceiling, and you can inject steam. And that's ideal. So what do you do? Well, baking inside a pot helps a bunch of those things. Uh, and, so, uh, and cast iron tends to hold the heat well. Uh, but then we discovered that um, we did a bunch of tests. If you use the fancy... Uh, uh, enameled Le Creuset kind of, it doesn't actually work very well. Um, yeah, it, it, you're better off, uh, it, it, uh, black uh, aluminum works better than the, uh, than like a enameled one. But the really cheap black ones like Lodge, those work great. And they have a thing called a combination cooker, which is sort of like a skillet that it, that you put on top of a thing and you put it upside down and it works great. Uh, you can get quite crusty breads uh, in it even in a home oven. Yeah? Sure. If steaming doesn't help oven spring, what's the benefit? It does make the bread uh, crispy. So but steam at the very beginning uh, will help create that skin like it does on the bow. And if it's a very brief amount of skin uh, of time, that'll be a very thin layer. Then as the bread bakes, that will remain thin. And that's what gives you the kind of crust you expect on a baguette. That's almost like an eggshell. And in fact, if you take a baguette and you hit it, you can see it cracks almost like an eggshell. And you can't get that combination uh, without steam. And you did say also that it helps with shine too, didn't you? It does. It definitely helps with shine uh, as well. Of course, you also can shine it with a glaze, right? Which is how the, the top of a brioche is shiny, and it's not because of the steam. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's let's take a break here. Let, uh, let's thank Nathan one more time. <laughs> little, uh, a little gift for I'm armed and dangerous, so. A, if you grab me at the break to ask a question, remember that. A very sharp bread knife. We have one more little piece of business before we lose you. I'd like to introduce Carl DeSmet from Piranhas to come down ah, yes. and make a special presentation. And this all ties into what he's going to talk about tomorrow in his talk as well. <laughs> well, tell them what this is for. Yeah, yeah, I'll hold this. Well, Nathan, uh, you know that we have your sourdough in our library, and we are very honored for that. And I brought here your certificate because you still didn't come to the library to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an open invitation. But this is the, the certificate showing that number 102 is yours. <laughs> and, uh, and you're very lucky we have a little extra gift. It's a new book that is on the market. And it's not a recipe book. It is not talking about history. It has actually nothing to do with you, what you have been writing, uh, but it is a, a book that shows uh, how sourdough could change people's life. And so, okay. I didn't weigh it before and after, <laughs> but I guess there is like three ounces of ink inside. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So congratulations, thank you very much. So, thank you, Carl. Uh, 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 let me explain. So uh, his company has a sourdough library that maintains sourdough cultures from all over the world. Uh, 
So we had developed our sourdough culture, which uh, we, we decided we should name. So we called ours Levon James. Um, uh, and so we are very proud that Levon James is in the Hall of Fame for, um, for sourdoughs. <laughs>